Hello. Welcome back to the Space Gulag. Today we'll find out what have happened. Had General Grievous killed Obi-Wan on Utapau before we begin. Special thanks to all of our patrons. If you want to support me in other ways, all the links are listed down below. And the next part of our miniseries comes out this Saturday. Our story begins on the planet of Otapo. General Obi-Wan Kenobi and General Grievous fought with each other across the vast battlefield. The Republic jumped the gun on the Separatists and they were caught completely off guard. The droid forces dug their heels into the ground and they forced the clones to dig them out. Shortly before the battle began, the Separatist leaders escaped the planet and made their way for the fiery world of Mustafar. As the battle progressed, a great chase was making its way through the battlefield. Both generals of opposing armies fought their final duel with each other. Grievous spent the entire duration of the race running away from Kenobi. In reality, Grievous was trying to get to his ship and escape the battle to regroup with the troops and figure out how they could conceivably win this war. When Grievous and Kenobi got to Grievous' ship, the two of them made into an intense fight. Moments into their fight, the two of them were fighting in fisticuffs. Kenobi, for whatever reason, thought it was a great idea to fight General Grievous, otherwise known as General Clanker, with his bare hands. This led Grievous to exchanging blows with his fist with Kenobi. Kenobi was a tactical genius most of the time, but this would cost him. As General Grievous had his protective shields ripped away from his lungs, he snapped and threw Kenobi across the platform they were fighting on. General Grievous grabbed an Electro Staff off the ground and marched his way forward towards Kenobi. Kenobi saw a blaster on the ground and reached out to grab it with the force, as General Grievous stumped on the blaster with his clawed feet. Kenobi tried his best to get up before General Grievous could get to him, but it was no use. General Grievous plunged the Electro Staff through Obi-Wan's head and used his claw to kick him off the platform. You were a fine adversary, Kenobi, but at the end, you were nothing but Jedi scum. General Grievous turned around and got into his Starfighter. He knew that the Separatists had lost his battle. General Grievous knew that he needed to repair his suit of armor before getting engaged in the combat again, but at the moment, it wasn't his biggest concern. Grievous was heading to Mustafar to get in contact with the Separatist leaders and discuss how they would take the fight to the Republic. On Utapau, the body of Kenobi wasn't anywhere to be found, and the men of the 212th were cleaning up the fight. Cody ordered the men to search the lower levels in case Kenobi fell off the lizard during his fight with Grievous. There was a certain amount of concern for the general, but Cody knew that this battle needed to be won before he got worried about his friend. The clones were winning the battle heavily, and in this moment it looked like the Clone Wars would be coming to an end, something that General Grievous would learn to be as a falsehood. When he arrived at the Mustafar system, he encountered the Separatist leaders. General Grievous had always been skeptical of Sidious, but now he was certain that his skeptics were rightly placed. The Separatist Council was sitting over droid forces galore, the Separatists had been holding back, and then slowly but surely events for General Grievous started to pile up in his mind. The way that Dooku was there immediately after his incident of which he was almost killed, and how the Sith were using him for their master plan. Of course the Separatist Council could just be brain dead, allocating their forces to the will of the Sith so that they could hold their fraudulent war. Grievous in the moment had a decision to retreat or wait for a better time. So he decided to take the fight back to the Republic, because everything he knew up until this point was a lie. Grievous looked around at the group of Separatist leaders and told them all, I will be taking control of the droid armies, effective immediately. You have allowed yourselves to be made into fools. Grievous pushed Nuke Gunray off of his feet and walked forward and stood over the table. All of these battles, the Outer Rim sieges were set up for a greater purpose. Grievous didn't know what the purpose was yet, neither did the Separatist Council, but he did know that there was a greater purpose to everything. He slammed his hand down on the table and called out to all droid forces across the galaxy, sending this message. This is General Grievous. I am taking control of the entire droid army. The Separatist Council has failed us. I will lead us to triumph. I am releasing the millions of battle droids that have been held in reserve for the entirety of the Clone Wars. This will be our finest moment. The second the hologram ended, General Grievous turned to his side and ignited his lightsabers and began cutting through the Separatist Council. General Grievous was beyond pissed. He realized that he was being played as a piece in this entire game. He was never meant to defeat Kenobi, and he wasn't ever meant to win this war. Well, the plans had changed. General Grievous, after slaughtering the Separatist Council, would depart from Mustafar to his hidden base and have his armor reconstructed. During this time, millions upon millions of battle droids would be dispatched to each respective battlefront, from Felucia to Kata Nimodia, all the way up to Boss Pity. On Coruscant, a message would come through from Commander Cody. Anakin and Mace stood side by side. They listened to Commander Cody's inform the Jedi Masters that General Kenobi had been found dead at the bottom of a pit. Mace responded thanking Commander Cody for the information and then turning to see Anakin. 
Skywalker had been through this exercise once before. Earlier during the Clone War, Obi-Wan faked his death, but this was clearly not that. Obi-Wan was confirmed dead and General Grievous had escaped the battle. Mace knew this was troublesome. He didn't want Kenobi to die, but with Obi-Wan dead, he couldn't convict the Chancellor of holding on to power for too long. There could be only one way for the Jedi to play this correctly if they wanted to remove Palpatine from power, but that wasn't in their hands at this moment, especially with Grievous on the loose. Palpatine at this point sat unaware of Grievous' betrayal and assumed everything was going to plan, considering he had the Separatist Council on Mustafar for the purpose of having them executed. Palpatine was anticipating on the Jedi messing up, which he knew was going to happen eventually, but he was a genius. There were several backup plans that he had so that he could come out victorious in every which situation, though the one thing he never accounted for was the survival of General Grievous. The invasion of Utapau was intended for Palpatine to kill Grievous. In Palpatine's mind, he didn't really see any real reason to believe that Kenobi would fail, because Obi-Wan was one of the few Jedi who had no issue surviving Grievous encounters. Also, the 212th was going there, so even if Kenobi failed in Palpatine's mind, Grievous would still be killed. Inside the Jedi Temple, Anakin took a deep breath. His eyebrows creased, and he could see Master Windu trying to find a way to coax him down. Of course, the most important thing to the Master of the Order was what could be done in the way of defending the Jedi Order. General Grievous escaping was terrible for the galaxy, and the Jedi needed to find a way to combat it. With Anakin having lost his master, he knew that the spiked attitude Anakin towards just about everyone and everything would only increase. His hostility would be enlarged, and truthfully, Windu didn't really want to deal with it. He remembered what happened the last time this happened, and quite frankly, at this point in the war, the Jedi couldn't afford Skywalker to become a loose cannon. Windu would ask Skywalker to go to the council chambers for the time being, and give himself some time to process the information. Windu continued telling Skywalker that he and the other Jedi would inform Palpatine of Kenobi's loss. Windu made a point to try and make sure Anakin knew to stay inside of the Jedi Temple. He really didn't want to deal with Anakin running off world and trying to be a hero. This was not the time for it. But as Anakin never listened to Windu, he left the communication room and made his way to the hangar bay, taking his ship to hyperspace into a hyperspace ring above the system and departing for Utapau. Anakin of course was worried about his wife, but now he was pissed. Obi-Wan was his best friend, and that coward ran away from the fight because he was going to lose. Skywalker was going to make sure Grievous suffered for killing Obi-Wan. While Windu wouldn't find out about this for a good while, he and his squad of Jedi would move to Palpatine's office to inform the Chancellor of what had happened on Utapau, being that it was very evident that General Grievous had escaped the planet. Over the course of several hours, the change in the winds of the war would be evident. While Order 66 wouldn't be executed after Palpatine's peaceful interaction with Windu, Tin, Kolar, and Fisto, they would learn about the resurgence of Druid forces. The first battlefields to see this would be in the Outer Rim. The one battle of Utapau would turn into a defense of Utapau. The struggle on Maegida would turn into a rout as droid forces cut down half of the Galactic Marines and killed Kiarimundi. On Felucia, it would be a massacre. The planet was deadly enough as it was, with every other plant or being being poisonous. But the droid reinforcements arrived, and Aayla Secure and the 327th Star Corps were completely obliterated. The few survivors were unlucky enough to face their death at the hands of the monsters that scavenged the night on Felucia. The Republic immediately recoiled as General Grievous took the mantle, and as Palpatine watched, all the battles quickly turn into losses. He wondered what could have changed. It's not like the clones or even the Jedi could just throw the war and lose it on purpose. No, that was far from the truth. That night, he tried to contact the Separatist Council. There would be no transmission going through. It's as if the entire council disappeared. Palpatine slowly connected the dots. It was General Grievous. He figured out the plot, and Palpatine had to make a judgment call. He was oh so close to victory. He could taste everything. He almost had everything he ever wanted, and Grievous stole it out from right under him. This didn't make Sidious happy at all. He was going to make the Kaylee warrior pay for it. While most of his people were wiped out, Sidious was going to make his people die by instantly cutting off their supply lines, starving the rest of their dreary population to extinction. Though this meant for Sidious that he had to live with the Jedi for some extra time. Though he was going to be extra careful because even Sidious could feel that the Jedi were onto him. Windu, on the other hand, was outraged. He was unbelievably pissed that Skywalker left the Jedi Temple for the front lines in haste. It's not that Anakin was trying to kill Grievous, it's that Anakin was being a rebel and going after revenge in a time where the Jedi desperately needed everyone to work in coordination. When Anakin arrived in the Outer Rim over the world of Utapau, he found a massive battle. The Separatists were striking back, and they caught the Republic way off guard. 
Skywalker piloted ship down into the chaos. The fight was extraordinary. The Separatists had such a large fleet, and the Republic was fighting only with the superior strategy they could fight with. The moment Skywalker engaged, a Venator shattered and exploded, sending the debris all across the battlefront. The Separatists were making a hard push, and in this moment Skywalker got a communication from the Jedi Temple, of which he answered. Skywalker, what are you doing? Master, the Separatists are back. They have many more forces than we imagined. The Admiral here told me they lost contact with Felucia and Megito. It's a trap. What do you mean? It looks like the droids were leading us into the Outer Rim so that they could ambush us. The war isn't as close to being over as soon as we thought. Finish off the battle and return to the temple. We'll discuss your actions later. We need you to be at your best. Windu, of course, was pissed, but he couldn't do anything. The best he could do was reaffirm to Skywalker that they were on the same side. That was just simply the truth. Windu may have not trusted Anakin, but he believed that if Anakin was the chosen one, then he should at the very least have faith that he would make the right decision, even though historically he proved to be incapable of doing so. While the second battle of Utapau was commencing, Padme Amidala would give birth to Luke and Leia on Coruscant. Palpatine hadn't made it clear to Anakin that he knew about the pregnancy yet, considering he'd been the one that put the nightmares inside of Anakin's mind. With the children being born though, Palpatine knew he had to make a move forward with his plans. He couldn't play the wife scapegoat game anymore, so he had to figure out how he could turn Skywalker to the dark side. Murdering both of his children or his wife, or even one of the children and his wife would be the perfect way to force him to choose the dark side of the force. Though with the death of Kenobi, even Sidious knew it wouldn't take much more than a little push to send Skywalker into the depths of the dark side of the Force. Regardless, General Grievous, after being fixed up, would take the mantle of a completely refurbished Separatist fleet. This fleet wasn't nearly as big as a fleet that was destroyed at Coruscant, but General Grievous knew that to hurt the Sith would be to hurt the Republic. Grievous didn't know the whole plan or what it was, but he did know that he would throw the Sith and the Jedi out of any power, and he would use everything he knew as a warrior, as a strategist, to his advantage, and he would take the fight to the Republic. Before the Republic abandoned the Outer Rim in lieu of being smacked in the face with droid reinforcements, Grievous was going to strike at the heart of the Republic. He was heading to the most crucial infrastructure of the Republic military, the Kuat Drive Yards. While yes, the Kuat Drive Yards were heavily defended, and were even producing the new Republic Star Destroyer, most of the Republic fleet had dispersed into the Outer Rim. Grievous realized how foolish Sidious was for hiding this from him, and now he was going to make Sidious pay. He was going to cross the galaxy and destroy every civilization until every Jedi and every Sith were dead and destroyed. And so Grievous gave the order and dispatched the Separatist fleet towards Kuat. While the battles of Felucia and Mankita were total losses, the Second Battle of Utapau and the Battle of Boss Pity would be won by the Republic. Anakin being in the Battle of Utapau was a very necessary morale boost that the Republic needed in the battle, which kind of gave Skywalker a free pass when he eventually returned to the Jedi Temple with Kenobi's body. During this time, Ahsoka would have returned to the Jedi Temple with Maul in custody, to which she would inform the Jedi present, that being Masters Windu, Tin, Kolar, Shakti, Fisto, and Plo Koon, who had just returned from a successful rout over Kato Nemodia, the information that Maul had told her. The only real reason Ahsoka was fine with relaying this information was because of the presence of Master Plo, otherwise she would have waited until Anakin arrived. Regardless, Ahsoka would inform the Jedi Council about what Maul said, how Anakin was being groomed to become the perfect destroyer of the balance in the Force. While Ahsoka's initial reaction wasn't Palpatine, Mace Windu nearly lunged from his seat. There was only one person in the galaxy who could possibly groom Skywalker. The reason Windu figured it out was the phrasing of which Ahsoka used in regards to what Maul said. Though Windu and the other council members would make their way down to where Maul was being kept after dismissing Citizen Ahsoka Tano. When the Jedi got down, they found Maul in the Mandalorian sarcophagus, where they opened up the case and made room for Maul to be able to speak. Though Maul wasn't too excited to share any details with them. The Jedi present were among the strongest in the Order, and they weren't going to play around. If the knowledge Maul had would decide the fate of light versus dark, then they surely couldn't allow this information to just drift away. Maul was very hesitant to speak, because he knew what would happen if he did. He'd be buried in whichever way the Jedi decided, and the Sith would vanish. Windu looked over at the other Jedi as he told them what they were going to do. Windu turned around first, and reached his hand up, using the Force, demanding that Maul tell them the truth about the Chosen One. Shakti joined in, raising her hand and demanding in the same way. Shortly after Shakti, Kit Fisto joined in, and then Sacy Tin, and then Agon Kolar. The last Jedi who raised his hand was Plo 
Plo Koon, who demanded the same thing, to know the truth about the Chosen One. The chant echoed through Maul's mind. He couldn't move, nor could he escape it. The more he resisted, the more it hurt. And while this may have been unorthodox for the Jedi Council, it was for the fight against the dark side. Over Kuat, General Grievous and his fleet exited hyperspace. The Kuat drive yards were not heavily protected, as General Grievous called out orders. Bring up the right side of the fleet and crush their capital ships. Squadrons 12 through 17, bomb their drive yards. Make sure there are no survivors. The Separatist fleet deployed, and the resistance was weak to say the least. The Republic was completely caught off guard. Most of the men thought the war was over, and most of the men here on Kuat hadn't ever seen action. And when the Separatist fleet arrived, they were in for pain. General Grievous wasn't playing around anymore, and he was going to take the fight directly to the Republic. When the bombers got to work, the Kuat drive yards began to crumble. The few Star Destroyers that were complete enough to enter combat weren't even fully capable of sustaining actual fleet combat, and so General Grievous took advantage of their weakness. With the Kuat drive yards facing absolute destruction, Grievous was cutting off the most crucial producer of Republic ships up the line for the Republic. All their Venators and Star Destroyers came from the Kuat drive yards. Most of the vessels produced elsewhere were support ships, whereas Kuat was crucial for the Republic war effort. Venators began to crumble and the few Star Destroyers had no chance to survive. General Grievous wasn't finished yet, as he ordered, Bombers, run a raid on the ground, crush their cities, obliterate their civilians, and make them suffer. Grievous cackled as he watched the bombers depart from the destruction of the drive yards and make their way down to the surface. There wasn't enough Republic fighters to defend their ground units. The amount of droid fighters were way too much for the Republic to handle. Grievous knew this and he used it against them as he ripped the Republic apart. The battle was very easily a success for Grievous, and when the battle was won, he pulled his fleet from Kuat and departed for deep space. General Grievous knew that this would heighten the Republic to knowledge of the capabilities of the Separatists, as their absolute loss at Megiddo and Felucia weren't a testament to that. On Coruscant, Anakin would return from victory at Utapal. The irony of Skywalker being able to claim victory without his main fighting force after losing his master was a true testament to his strength as a leader and as a motivationalist. Skywalker, upon his return to Coruscant, would avoid the Jedi Temple and head for Padme's residence. While Anakin knew that he was likely in trouble, he was missing the Jedi by just a little. The Jedi at the moment were departing from the Chancellor's office. When Anakin landed outside of Padme's residence, he ran in looking for her. Of course, the death of his master still with him, he had to return from that and make sure that his wife was alright. And when he turned around the corner, she looked incredibly different. Skywalker ran over and asked her, Are you okay? Yes, Annie. Come here. Anakin came around the corner and saw two children, and his eyes watered. They were both so beautiful, it turned out that his nightmares were all wrong. They must have been deception led by the Force. Anakin was so incredibly happy that she was okay, but at the same time incredibly saddened that he couldn't be there with her when she gave birth, though Padme truly understood why he couldn't be there. He was the pride of the Republic, the general that everyone knew of. He won every battle and he was the most renowned Jedi across the face of the Republic. The two of them talked about naming the two children, and then Anakin said, Well, why don't we use both the names we came up with had it just been one child? Name the girl Leia and the boy Luke. I love it, Annie. Leia and Luke are perfect names for twins. While Anakin was with Padme, a massive duel took place across the city. While Yoda was still on Kashyyyk holding off the Separatists, he gave the go-ahead for the other council members. Windu and the rest of the present council discovered that Sidious was a chance for the Republic through Maul, and they relayed this information to Yoda. This of course took hours of force torturing Maul, because after all, spending a decade under trash and losing your legs would cement your mind into a fortress. But nothing of course is comparable to the power of the force, and the Jedi I knew that. Maul eventually broke telling them everything he knew regarding the whole plan, but the one behind everything was Skywalker and Palpatine. While Skywalker was just an important tool in the process, Maul was still trying to figure out everything else, but what he got out to the Jedi was invaluable information, and so they took it and fled across the city and confronted the Sith Lord. The duel was outrageously long and took the lives of Master Shock T. Agon Kolar and Sacy Tin. Sidious was using both of his blades, and the three remaining Jedi were too good even for Sidious, though it would take their combined effort to defeat Sidious, and it would be Mace Windu who would land the killing blow, through the usage of a pod and shatter point. The most difficult part of this process would be informing the ever so anti-Jedi Senate. It would be so much harder than defeating Sidious. The fight with Sidious was a test of physical strength, whereas the fight with the Senate would be one of mental toughness. The Jedi would have to prove their reasoning behind killing the Chancellor. 
but because the Jedi had recorded evidence of a known Sith Lord revealing Palpatine as the Sith Lord and his plan, really nothing that the Senate could do would disprove what the Jedi had to say. The hearings would only last a couple of days, and shortly after the hearings, the Republic and the Separatists would call for peace. Anakin's reaction to it wasn't as inherently negative, because his children were born and they were safe, his wife was safe, and he wasn't exactly thrilled to find out that his friend started a war, tried to get his wife killed, got his master killed, and unleashed a beast like General Grievous to the front lines of combat. The Separatists and the Republic would agree to peace, but peace would not ensue, and the reason being that General Grievous was not a member of the Separatists anymore. He was fighting his own war, and he was going to win his own war. His plan was to dismantle both the Separatists and the Republic, which would lead to what after? Not even he knew, but he was going to make everyone pay. Though the downside of the Separatist Peace Treaty was the fact that the Techno Union and the Trade Federation shut down their joint forces, leaving General Grievous with half of his original fighting force, which really wasn't all that big of a deal because Grievous still had enough droids to take a strong fight and stance against the Republic and the Separatists. While the Jedi originally thought the war was won, a crushing loss for the Republic at Bothawai would deter their victorious thoughts. Initially, the Republic would accuse the Separatists of doing this, but when they showed off their command to shut down all droid forces and droid factories, all signs pointed towards the ever repugnant General Grievous, who was staying alive and taking the fight to the now united Republic. When General Grievous learned that the Separatists cut off his supplies, he decided that everyone was his enemy, and so he targeted the Techno Union and invaded their homeworld, ripping apart their entire civilization, turning their droid factories on, and reprogramming all the droid forces to serve him and him alone. Grievous felt the galaxy fall on him, and he wasn't going to allow that to happen. Directing command to super tactical droids, he ensured that his ranks were supported with the best minds the Separatists had. With the Trade Federation backing away, the enemies of the droid rebellion continued to mount. The Nemodians would turn their fleets on rebellious droids, and the Clone Wars would extend into a fourth year of combat. During this extended reign of terror, Jedi would abandon the Jedi Order. Anakin wouldn't be one of those Jedi, because he was on the front lines. He was now leading a combined unit of the 212th and 501st, referred to as the 713th. It was the most elite batch of clone troopers in the Grand Army of the Republic, and they were tasked with one important mission, destroy General Grievous. Because of this insurgency of Grievous, the Senate put behind them their disliking of the Jedi, as the galaxy found one reason to collectively unite. A reason to take the fight to General Grievous, and a reason to put rivalries aside for the betterment of the galaxy. What ended up happening was a coalition of clone troopers and droid forces, led by Generation 1 tactical droids and Nemodians, that would begin to fight the droid rebellion. The overbearing numbers game put General Grievous at a severe disadvantage, but considering he had the largest fleet and the largest army in his little rebellion, which in turn made him not want to be too worried about his two foes. Midway through the fourth year of the Clone War, General Grievous' fleet was caught off guard by a surprise attack led by General Skywalker and Admiral Yularen. The droid rebellion was completely blindsided over the planet of Hypori, and so the best generals of the war collided in an epic fight of the balance of the galaxy. While the war hadn't yet been turned in the best direction for General Grievous, the truth is he was still able to implement damage galaxy-wide, wiping out entire star systems, leaving no survivors, and continuing in his rampage across the galaxy. When the battle began, Grievous ordered his bombers into the same formation he used over Kuat, but with a fighter like Skywalker and fighter squadrons comprised of the 713, there was no saying that Grievous could easily, even feasibly, stop Skywalker. Their ships entered combat with the droid rebellion, and it was painfully obvious from the beginning of the fight that this would be a standstill, until one side gave in. The Republic fleet had two Star Destroyers and was equipped with experimental interdictors. The only way this battle would last is if the Republic was beaten back, or if the droids retreated to the surface of the planet, neither of which Skywalker wanted to happen. Anakin prepared a squad of clone troopers to come with him and attack Grievous' capital ship if they got the opportunity. Though the chances of this happening were extremely rare, the squad was made up of Rex, Cody, Jesse, and a number of other elite troops that were on standby. Regardless, Skywalker led a counter strike on the droid forces and pushed back against them as best as he could. The bombers had a considerable amount of numbers that came with them, considering there were hundreds of bombers, so Skywalker and his squad of fighters couldn't get all of them. So when the few bombers broke through the defense line of the Republic support ships, the bombers made their way to hit the capital ships. The support ships trying to protect the Republic capital ships didn't really work, and so the Republic Star Destroyers lost their shield generators and slowly began to lose power. The amount of droids present were comparable to the Battle of Coruscant, not nearly as many, but enough to make the Republic strategy need to be absolutely perfect. 
Anakin knew that with the shields down on one of his heavy hitters, the Republic fleet needed to make up in strategy. Anakin diverted control of his squad over to his wingman as he broke away and landed inside of the hangar bay of Grievous' flagship. Anakin didn't order his elite squad to join him, because it was far too risky for them to cross the battlefield. He was going to take in this role alone, with the plan of obviously coming out victorious. As Skywalker landed, he escaped his vessel and used the Jedi speed to escape into the hallways before a number of droids could shoot at him. As the battle outside the vessel rocked the ship and Admiral Yularen brilliantly created a strategy to combat Grievous on every front, considering he had time to study Grievous' strategy and maximize performance against him. Regardless, Skywalker got to the command deck and called out to General Grievous. Grievous, you're gonna die. Not so fast, Jedi scum. I have to rid the galaxy of your filth. Then you'll have to go through my dead body. That won't be so challenging, Skywalker. Three lightsabers ignited as the two of them moved in at each other hastily. Grievous planned on ambushing Skywalker, but little did he know how much Skywalker grew in the short period of time since the Battle of Coruscant. He had become so much more powerful, and Anakin believed it was in part of his paternal love for his children, that maybe his unconditional love allowed him the freedom to access more power in the Force. And so, as the two of them began to duel, six Magna Guards jumped up from around the bridge, and it was an ambush designed to kill Skywalker. But as Anakin heard the clanking of their boots, he moved his blade forward to push Grievous back as he lifted his other hand, and the droids began to collapse in on themselves. As their gears crumbled and Anakin crushed all of them up into many pieces before throwing them to multiple sides of the command bridge, destroying pilot droids. Grievous growled, igniting two more lightsabers and lunging forward. Anakin was ready. He may have been an offensive talent, but he wasn't going to allow General Grievous to get away. This was revenge for Kenobi's death. This was for every life that Grievous took throughout the Clone Wars. Skywalker doubled back and used the Force to lift Grievous up into the air, channeling the dark side of the Force. Anakin choked the cyborg, crushing his lungs and then compressing Grievous' body in on itself as he ripped him apart from the inside out. Grievous howled in pain. Anakin didn't stop as he threw his lightsaber forward, cutting through Grievous. Anakin earlier in the war may have not been able to do that, but Anakin now wouldn't be stopped. And so with the death of Grievous, Anakin used a force and ignited all the turbo lasers on the bridge, directing their blaster fire towards the surrounding Separatist vessels as the droid pilots tried to figure out what was happening. They lost control, but it was too late. As the surrounding vessels were torn apart, Grievous' flagship became an enemy to the rest of the droid forces as they all turned on each other, as Anakin gave a little salute to the droids still on deck before turning around and booking it. Calling through his comm link, he got a hold of his droid. R2 fire up the engines. We're blowing out of this piece of junk. R2's quick response made Anakin eager to hop into his cockpit. The ship he was in started to blow apart, and the sound of metals exploding and corridors lining with fire followed Skywalker. He ran through the corridors to the hangar bay and hopped into his starfighter, and pushing the engines forward, flying out of the ship as it exploded behind him. The clones all saw General Skywalker as they lined up behind him and followed him into victory. Skywalker would lead the Republic into victory against the Republic's greatest opponent after the death of Sidious. Skywalker's victory would be heralded as the work of a true hero, and a hero's welcome he would receive upon his return to Coruscant, but all the accomplishments he had wouldn't keep him from his wife, because upon his return he would leave the Jedi Order and the Grand Army of the Republic to be with his wife and children. The Republic with total and absolute victory would return to the days of peace. With new leadership and new hope for the future, the galaxy sightedly prepared for this new era of peace without the Sith. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our story. Again, special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Tiger Boy, Darth Revan, Pimp Daddy Bane, Darth Cheesy Apollo, Mad Many Studios, Anakin 003, Lemon Knight, Flynn Ben Cease, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Hit 2,000 likes on this video if you want to see what comes next. I don't know what it is, but it is. Uh, other things, all you things we already know. Episode 2 of the Sith Clone Wars comes out on Saturday, as I mentioned earlier, and let's talk about our story. So, yeah, that was fun. Um, I wanted to have a different story. I didn't wanted to just end with like with Palpatine just dying and so I wanted to make another villain the main villain for this episode or this video uh because like I, I talk about this a lot um I kind of have to nerf Palpatine a lot because he's the only villain ever in all of Star Wars and so that's kind of where my struggle is and I talk about this every so often in most videos because Palpatine's like the main antagonist here and so having to like delineate like delude not delude having to move away from grievous or having to move away from palpatine to make grievous the main villain was a lot more fun for me making grievous like be him was a lot for a lot more fun because he's a little bit more unhinged like yes palpatine's a psycho but um grievous is unhinged because he's really good at just killing like that's his thing palpatine is unhinged because he's technically smart he's just really he's really smart in the art of like 
defying. And so the only reason the Jedi really find out about him and the only reason the Jedi can defeat him is because of Maul. Now this story kind of has like a whole lot of moving parts going on in it. And so it's, it's a convoluted story. And that's kind of what I wanted. I wanted the story to be a lot more intense um, than the other ones because like there's a lot that happens. I mean, killing Obi-Wan changes everything. I mean, Obi-Wan is the crux of why everything happens in Star Wars, and that's not a diss on him. He's just He just happens to be there for everything. And so removing Obi-Wan from the situation changes the entire dynamic. Anakin is probably going to go on to an angry like rage. Like He's going to just be like, yeah, I'm going to kill everything that moves because I'm the broken one. And so that's what he does. He just goes on a, on a rampage trying to kill Grievous. And, you know, hit like Anakin moving away from Coruscant to do that allows room for Ahsoka to return, which allows time for the Jedi to interrogate or interrogate, yeah, interrogate um, Maul, which leads to Palpatine's dis dismiss dismissal dismissal. Yeah, let's say dismissal. <laughs> um, anyways, hope you all enjoyed the story. The story was a lot of fun. If you did, smash the like button. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video. I love you all. Spread the love. Always remember, my friends, may the Force be with you.